Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fidelis. This is Lauren and Cassie. We're coming to you from Texas and Florida, respectively. Um, today, we are going to talk about body image. And I'm excited about this topic because I think this is something that affects everybody. So we've talked about um, marriage and single life and religious life and like different things that affect specific women. But this is something that every single one of us deals with. And especially in this like age, this post-Puritan America, I feel like especially this is something that um, is kind of a, a universal struggle in the United States and elsewhere. So um, how are you today, Cassie? I'm doing okay. How about you? Great. Good. I have one sick kid down right now, but one of them just got better. So I'm trying to focus on the fact that one got better. I feel like from October to, to like February, there's just someone sick in my house perpetually. Um, it's just that time of year. But I hope everyone else's kids are a little healthier than mine right now. <laughs> so um, yeah, so uh, body image. So in order to tie this kind of like into our Catholic faith and make it relevant to this particular group, um, I'm just going to go into a little bit of like the Catholic theology of the body. Um, I was privileged to be able to take uh, theology of the body from Dr. Michael Waldstein at Ave Maria University, and he's like the one of the biggest um, theology of the body scholars in the U.S. Um, but I will say that was a few years ago, and I'm super rusty, so I'm just going to give you like a rudimentary overview of kind of what I remember, and then tell everybody that um, I really encourage you to purchase the book Theology of the Body by John Paul II. Um, the translation that I read was the one translated actually by Dr. Balchstein himself. And so um, that's a great place to go after this conversation if you're intrigued by what we talk about today. Um, so the, ba the foundation of um, the Catholic view of the body is that our bodies are inherently good. Um, and that we're created in the image of God. And I don't think we can overstate the importance of this fact because it's completely counter to the cultural narrative, which is that your body is good subjectively based on different factors. Like your body is good if it looks good. Um, your body is good if it looks good in the opinion of a certain man, or your body is good if it's healthy, or your body is good if it's a certain gender, or your body, just the the list goes on of reasons why our culture can say that your body is not good. And mm -hmm. in Catholic theology, that and this even sets us apart from like a lot of Protestant theologies where humans are born in total depravity and everything about them is like... Uh, flawed, um, including their bodies. That's that's not really the church's stance. So the church says all of creation is created as a reflection of the creator. And man, especially because he has reason, which sets us apart from every other animal and inanimate creation, um, is particularly um, created in the image of God. And that includes in our bodies. So even if our bodies have um, flaws, or um, imperfections, they are still created in the image of God. Um, so that, I feel like that's the fundamental message of Catholic theology when it comes to the body. There's so much more to it in the theology of the body, but that's the basic message. And I think that's the foundation on which we can have this whole conversation about um, body image in our culture today. Because if we can always come back to the fact that we're objectively and inherently good, then um, we can like kind of have a blueprint for how to interpret the messages that are coming at us from the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, um, we also have to like consider that the church has kind of like guidelines uh, when it comes to caring for and respecting our bodies and the bodies of others. So we know that the church views like gluttony as a sin. It views sexual immorality as a sin. And why is that? Well, it always comes back to the fact that our bodies are inherently good and reflections of God. So the church isn't saying don't because we're depraved and making these things will make doing these things will make us worse. The church is saying don't do these things because they basically are a betrayal of the goodness, the inherent goodness of our bodies. And so we practice sexual morality and we eat healthy and we um, exercise all because we're honoring the goodness that our, our bodies are. Mm -hmm. 
So that's kind of just like my little theology background. Um, but we kind of want to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of um, how, one, how we were raised to view our bodies, maybe in our own families, in our own homes, um, in our own inner circles, and then more broadly, what's the message from the culture about our bodies, and then how do we respond to that in the way that we dress and um, the way that we practice our own beauty. Um, so Cassie, I will throw this, I know we both have like personal stories related to how our families taught us to view our own bodies. So what was kind of like the message regarding your body and, and your dignity uh, growing up? Well, I mean, like we discussed in our previous videos, um, I wasn't raised Catholic, so we definitely didn't have the issue of, you know, body bodily dignity the way that the church you know, teaches it. That wasn't something that we were ever aware of. But being thin was a very big topic um, through my whole childhood. And to be honest, it wasn't even something I was really aware of. It just because it wasn't like as a child, it wasn't something that my parents would say to me. Um, but just I mean, growing up, it was always, you know, my mom and my dad both talking about, oh, I'm so fat, you know, I'm so overweight, you know, I'm going on a diet, I need to work out more, you know, and it was always um, just these constant fad diets or, you know, going on this new workout, you know, regimen or, or joining this gym and just all the time. And um, the funny thing is, is that looking back now as an adult, you know, there were times that my parents may have been a little bit bigger or smaller, whatever the case may be. But even then, like I remember as a kid telling, you know, my mom, like, you're not fat. Stop saying that mm -hmm. because they would say it all the time and they weren't, you know, but that was the culture in my household was this emphasis on weight all the time and appearance. And then I think it was around middle school when I started going into puberty and developing and getting older. That was when it started to be more directed towards me. Like if I put, you know, mayonnaise on a sandwich, I remember my dad saying this one time, you might as well just smear that all over your hips because that's where it's going to go. And it was like, I mean, just, I mean, obviously now this is 20 years later. I still remember it. So it, it stands out. And you know, my mom would say things like, like I'd be in high school about how I needed to watch what I was eating because I've started to gain weight. And I was a size five in high school. I was a size five. Um, and now I can look back and appreciate that very much. But at the time I thought I was huge. I thought I was so, so fat. I never felt comfortable in my body. I don't remember a time pretty much after puberty that I felt comfortable with the way that I looked. I always thought I was fat. I always thought I was overweight. And I always felt like I needed to, you know, be trying to lose weight. Even like I said, when I was a size five, when I was, I mean, that's pretty small. And then I start getting older, you know, I mean, the older I got, I don't, I mean, I don't want to say the bigger I got, but you know, mm -hmm you get older and you gain weight, you know, especially once I've had kids and now I'm nowhere near a size five, but it's made it really hard to be comfortable in my own skin because that emphasis on your weight and losing weight and the way that you look stays with you. And I don't think that they were doing it in a mean spirited way. I think for them, they genuinely were, were trying to help. We want her to be healthy. We want her, you know, but to have that kind of negative undercurrent all the time growing up that you have to, you have to be skinny. You have to be thin. You have to be fit. It's good to be fit. It's good to be healthy. But if that's what you're focusing on all the time, it's going to have negative repercussions for you long-term. And it has, it has for me, because like I said, it, it's really hard to be comfortable in your own skin when that's what you were raised with. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally, um, my, my experience was really similar to yours, the way that my family spoke about um, body image and weight and just focused a lot on um, appearance. Um, one thing that, that kind of stood out to me when you were talking is like, I'm reminded that 
when the focus, when the reason why we eat healthy, take care of our bodies, exercise, um, try to appear presentable, when the reason is because it's, it's superficial, um, then I think aging is always going to be seen as a negative. Like aging can't possibly be a good thing when part of our value comes from looking young or fit or thin because we, and you see, you start to see this when you, when you do have kids, um, everything kind of goes to pot all at once for a lot of us. I mean, for me, it was just all over the second that first I had, it, my first baby was over 10 pounds and it was just over. Like <laughs> there's no coming back from that without like plastic surgery, which I'm not going to get. Um, so it, I, for me, I grew up very much with that um, being extremely self-conscious. And I don't think my, my parents were even that obsessive about, um, the things that they said and the ways that they, um, viewed the body. I mean, there were things that were said that stuck with me, but I think they had such, the things that were said had such a strong effect on me in, in my immediate family and my extended family, um, that I would take them to the extreme. So I remember really similar to you being like 12 or 13 years old. And I was thin. I was like, probably at that point, I was like five, six and probably were weighed like a hundred pounds. Um, and I thought that I was really overweight also. And I, I did go through a period of, it was never diagnosed, but looking back, I realized that I was anorexic during that time. Um, and I, I would eat, you know, I would have three chips and calculate like how many calories was that. And then I would feel guilty for having three chips, you know, or something. And that, I feel like that behavior gave way to once I had my first child, um, I was like, well, my body went to pot. Why should I even care? And so I just went to the other extreme of not caring about fitness or what I was eating. And I think both of those extremes came from the fact that I wasn't appreciating that, like, our bodies are inherently good. And the reason that we take care of them isn't as much for the appearance of them. It's because that is what we're called to do as like stewards of creation. Our bodies are creation. And so we, we should take care of them for that reason. And so it took me, it's only been in the last few years that I've become comfortable in my body and like appreciated it. And I think the more kids that I had too, the more I appreciated how amazing my body was for what it was capable of doing. After my third child, especially, um, I hemorrhaged really badly and I almost had to get a hysterectomy. And I remember just going through that whole process and being like, wow, I mean, between modern medicine, because that's the only reason I didn't have a hysterectomy is because of a new invention that just came out a few years ago. And, um, and just the amazing ability that our bodies have, that was so badass and miraculous and amazing that my body could do that. And so that, that was kind of like a wake up for me. And ever since then, it's been, I've been able to have like a bit of a healthier view of my own body, but I still really struggle with it, just like I know so many others do. And you and I were talking to some of our peers about this um, and a resounding theme that we found in those conversations was that um, what was said to us at home and in our own families had this like staying power that affected how we viewed our bodies up until the present day. And I found that, I guess it made me realize that that was true for myself, but I thought it was so eye opening because I feel like, um, most Catholics, the the way that we deal with um, improper views of the body, whether it's um, with the glorification of like anorexia or sexual immorality in the culture, is we say like, oh, pop culture is such a bad influence on our kids. Mm -hmm. But in reality, um, I mean, that's true. But in reality, what are we setting our kids up to um, value? based on the things that we're saying, not just to them about their bodies, but about our own bodies in front of them. And so I'm trying to be, and I still, I still fail at this, but I'm trying to be really conscious of how I talk about my own body in front of my kids. Yes, me too. Yeah, I, that's definitely true because the interesting thing I think about it is that the impact that your family has when you're growing up on your body image and how you see yourself it's so strong and so pervasive that even now, I mean, I, I still struggle with my body image. I mean, there's times where I feel okay with how I look, but I mean, most of the time I struggle with it. And even though my family now 
I have my husband that will, you know, tell me all the time that I'm beautiful or sexy or, you know, whatever the case may be. Or my kids will sit there and, you know, mommy, you're so beautiful. Even hearing those things from my family now, it still doesn't kind of permeate that the, the, the shell of feeling insecure about how I look. And I feel like that's because I grew up with this kind of negative atmosphere surrounding body image. And so when I think about my kids, I don't want them to grow up with those feelings. I don't want them to grow up and not be able to believe it when their spouse tells them that they love the way that they look. Mm -hmm. So it's something to be really conscious about. Um, I don't want them to be always thinking that they're overweight or that they aren't attractive and they should be happy with the way that they look. They should be happy with what their body can do because like you said, it's inherently good. So it puts a lot of pressure on us as parents to, you know, do better. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the whole generation preceding ours just grew up and it's probably, it was probably like systemic for them too. Like their parents probably made the same type of comments and then they passed mm -hmm. that on. And I feel like a lot of us are coming to this point where it's like, we have to break this cycle. And mm -hmm. I think that's true in the broader culture too. But the, I think the problem in the broader, broader culture when you see like um, people, you know, breaking their scales because they're revolting against the idea that like weighing yourself, it, you know, is important. There's they you can go to that other extreme where it's like you're not taking care of yourself at all in reaction to the overemphasis on caring for your body. So I love how the church kind of provides that middle ground where it's like you're good and therefore you should also practice healthy habits. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is important to be healthy. So, it, I mean, the point here is not to say, oh, well, you know, don't work out or don't watch what you eat. You know, right. Obviously, these are good things. Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to find a way to be comfortable in the skin that you live in now. Yeah. And that's easier said than done. <laughs> but yeah. that should be the goal and it should be about being healthy not what the number on the scale is or what size clothes you wear and being able to see yourself how others see you yeah this is something that I thought about for years and years and years since I think I was in my early 20s I sat there and would think to myself because like I said I've struggled with this my entire life I would think to myself I wish I could see myself how other people see me because I know how I feel. I know how I look at myself in the mirror. How do other people see me? Right. I have a feeling it's probably different and a lot better. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to do that. It's so hard to look at yourself and see yourself the way other people do. Yeah, and even harder but more important, I think, is how can we see ourselves how God sees us? Because mm -hmm. he's, like, enamored by you. And just to think that, you know, your husband, both of our husbands, we have really – um, supportive husbands when it comes to this they are always encouraging us about our bodies but like the way that God sees us is exponentially more um, is as exponentially more beautiful than even our husbands view us and so that that's always something that like brings me back back home I think to the center is trying to trying to see my my own value in God's eyes and that's really a struggle especially because all these messages and in magazines and TV is saying like your body's good if it's this shape and you don't have any imperfections and I mean that whole attitude is is what drives the culture of death too I mean if we're really honest about it it the child doesn't have the right genetic makeup and so therefore we can abort it or it's going to have a club foot or a cleft palate and so therefore we can abort it i mean it just it's it's been taken to the extreme or even um, i mean with, even after that though too you know like look at the movie me before you i feel like i'm going off on a tangent but no i hate <laughs> that's <laughs> you get into a car accident or whatever the case may be or you know you get some kind of disease or condition or whatever the case may be. And now you're living with a disability. Oh, well, you know, Hey, go get euthanized because it's better to be dead than it is to be disabled. Yeah. Cause your body isn't your value. It doesn't come from your inherent goodness in that worldview. It comes from your utility and your lack of suffering, like your ability to enjoy life. And 
that I think that's a worldview that will ultimately lead anyone who practices it to despair at some point in their life, whether they end up committing suicide or being euthanized or not. Um, that that can that worldview cannot end well <laughs> for anybody. I don't think. And the other part too of it is that it kind of, and this is something that you, know, you mentioned we crowdsourced again that people had mentioned, is that it kind of can affect. Um, you know, your sexuality as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know when we asked our friends uh, about this topic, a lot of people automatically went to um, how the messages that they heard at home and from their families affected the way that they viewed their bodies um, and how their sexual interactions went. Or I know one person said that she was sexually assaulted at one point, and that had an effect on the way that she viewed her own body. Um, in every way going forward from that. And so those two things are so tied. And I mean, we touched on it a little bit in the beginning, but the the church's um, teaching on the body is is really tied to sexuality too, because it goes back to Adam and Eve and how man and woman were created different, but are complementary, and um, how mutual respect between men and women um, is the way that we affirm the dignity, our dignity as like created in the image of God. Yes. Uh, <laughs> on that at all? Well, I, I mean, it, it's, I mean, all of that is true, but then again, it, it just, it comes down to, it's so much easier to read those things and know them logically than it is to believe them. And when you have a poor body image, when it comes to your sexuality, I mean, think about it, when you're having sex, it is, probably the most vulnerable that you can be with someone. And I think about it, you know, I sit there and go, Oh my God, my stretch marks are, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, you, you sit there and you, all of that is on display. Mm -hmm. There's no hiding it. You can't hide anything about yourself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course it's going to affect your sexuality and you can be cognizant of, okay, well, this is what the theology of the body is. And, you know, sex is inherently good and my body is inherently good, but it can be hard to believe those things. Absolutely. Really take Absolutely. it in. Yeah. And I feel like this is a, another plug for like good husbands because your <laughs> husband is seriously like your, your husband can help you to understand how God sees you and how you should view yourself. Um, if he's accepting and loving of you in spite of whatever imperfections that you have. And so, yeah, the vulnerability is there, but it can also, over time, I think it can be healing to like go through that vulnerability, but have a good, um, good feedback from the other person in the process, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And actually, I think it's it's kind of funny because I had never really thought of it before the way that you had framed it, you know, the way our husbands look at us. That's how God looks at us, except better. I never thought about it that way before, but I feel like that's something helpful, you know, to sit there and remember because it means a lot to me. I mean, even though there's as soon as he says it, there's automatically that thought of doubt in my mind. Oh, well, you know. He doesn't really mean it. Like he'll sit there, he'll put his hands on my waist. And I say that specifically for a reason. Then mm -hmm. he'll put his hands on my waist and be like, God, you know, your body is just so amazing. You're so beautiful. And I'll sit there. And the first thing in my mind is my stomach is huge. What are you talking about? That's and the first thing I think of. Mm -hmm. I don't believe him. Right. You know? And so to sit there and think about, okay, well, he says these things. This is how he sees me. And then to step even further back and go, well, Oh my gosh, like that's how God sees me too. That's a really powerful way of looking at it. From your yeah. Well, and not to make this morbid at all, that's not how I mean this, but this <laughs> is the whole like basis of the church's like teaching against self harm or suicide, um, anorexia, things like that would harm our body because it's like God embracing you and saying, wow, you're amazing. And then you're saying to God, no, I'm not. And that's really a slap in his face because he's the one who made you. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And so it's a good, the church is teaching against like self-harm and suicide and stuff is not a don't do this, you know, because you'll go to hell because it's just a terrible thing to do. It's like the reason that that is wrong is because it's basically telling God, 
I don't, I don't appreciate what you gave me and I don't believe you when you say you love me. Yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed too, that like my husband, if I'll sit there and, you know, I don't, I want to say challenge him, but like when he'll say things like that and I'll say, Oh no, I'm not stop. He gets a little bit offended. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I can see the similarities there. And the thing is too, is that when it comes to body image, it's not just weight either. I mean, it's everything, you know, your, your skin, your hair, the way you look, the way you dress, the way you feel about how you, you look. And as women, especially, especially adult women, the further you get into adulthood, the harder it is to make time for self-care. And I think that's because a lot of women kind of tend to take everything on themselves and we're always wanting to give, give, give and do things for other people and take care of everyone else that we kind of forget to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm really guilty of this. Actually, since we're segging into self-care, I think that's perfect. Like, I would, I would love it if um, other women like would tell us what they do for self-care. And I'll share a little bit about, I recently started doing the Miracle Morning. I know a, a lot of people do similar things, um, but this, this thing that I'm doing is called Miracle Morning and they have like a Facebook group. But it's where you kind of like wake up before everyone in your house and you go through these five steps of um, silence, affirmations, visualization, um, exercise, reading, and scribing or writing. And it's just kind of like this process of starting your day in um, focused on your goals and taking care of yourself. And I love that it's first thing in the morning because it, it won't get pushed out of your schedule when you start your day with it. And it starts your day off in a way where, okay, I'm taken care of, therefore I'm empowered to like go out and take care of, I mean, in your case, you have five kids, <laughs> like you have a huge exhausting job. And I know when I was trying to like push self care to the end of the day, it just like didn't happen uh, many yeah. times. So just throwing that out there, I, I'm not, um, like endorsing the organization or anything like that, but that's just something to like Google and maybe pattern your own morning routine around because it's helpful. Well, and I think having the community there is really helpful too. And there's the group that we're both in that's, mm -hmm. you know, devoted to fashion and beauty. And yeah. There was the thread a little while back that someone had talked about, you know, thanking everyone for the group because it's not just good for, for my parents. This is good for my soul. And it's the same way that I feel too, because having this community of people that's devoted to, you know, fashion and beauty and taking care of your skin and making yourself look, look nice. And, and it's like this reminder every day, you know, you'll see these posts and it's like, Oh, well, there's a new lipstick I can try or there's some new, a new hairstyle I can do or, or whatever. They're shallow things almost on the surface. But at the same time, it's like, it's a reminder to be doing these things for yourself. It's not vanity to do something that's going to make you feel good because when you feel good about yourself, I mean, it's, it's more than just a surface image. It's, it improves your confidence. It improves your sense of self-worth. And so having that community there, it makes a huge difference, regardless of where you get it from. Having that community that can that can be affirming you and helping you with self-care that's pushed to the side for so many women, it makes such a big difference. Yeah, for sure. I definitely went through this long phase when I had started having kids where – actually, it started before that. I think I was still – it was like halfway through college where I was kind of like, I became very utilitarian in the way that I lived my life. And I wasn't even thinking at the time that that was um, kind of at odds with Catholic teaching in a way, because the way that I was um, living my schedule and taking care of myself was what's going to make me the most productive. And I wasn't really worrying about anything else. So I, I didn't really do hair, makeup, worry about what I was going to wear. I kind of created just like a daily uniform and it was not flattering. Um, and this kind of, this mentality just kind of like stayed with me where it was like, I don't spend time on what I considered to be frivolous, like beauty and fashion, because I've got all these things that I need to accomplish. And in my mind, I was thinking, um, I need to be productive because um, that's the way like to, you know, bolster the kingdom and like live my vocation and, and be the most effective that I can be. But um, I think that I was being short sighted and the I think I had to stop being so utilitarian um, when I started to come back to like, 
hey, why was I, you know, trying to dress nicely before I went through this utilitarian phase? And why did I wear makeup before and do my hair and uh, make sure that I got regular exercise and all these things? And um, now I can do them with intentionality, I think, where I'm and it, that also helps to keep me balanced. So I'm trying to have the intention now, and I'm still learning this because this is, I'm I'm still new to being to caring about like fashion and beauty again. Um, but now I'm trying to have the intention of I'm taking care of myself because I have dignity and because I want to be presentable, um, so that I can do live my vocation better. And um, that's been helpful to me, and it's helped to keep things balanced so that. I know I'm not putting on makeup because I just want people to look at me or something, but I'm doing it with a better intention, I think. Yeah, and um, since I've had other people to kind of you know bounce ideas off of and get feedback, and it's made me want to do it more, where usually, I mean, because like you said, I have five kids and it's, I just, I don't want to put in the time and the effort, you know, to do more than I have to. So a lot of times it's, you know, yoga pants and, you know, a t-shirt and sandals when I'm off to run my errands and no makeup because I don't have time for that. Right. But it's been helpful to have this community there to encourage me to, you know, continue to try these new things because then I do it. You know, now a lot of times when I run errands, I'll take five minutes to put on some makeup. It's mm -hmm. not usually this kind of makeup, but, <laughs> you know, it's more like low key. But it makes me feel better. I've noticed that over the past few weeks. It makes me feel better. I walk out the door and I feel better about the way that I look. Putting in that little bit of extra effort for self-care makes such a big difference. Even if you're not at your goal weight, even if you have stretch marks and cellulite everywhere, you know, putting on a dress that makes you feel nice or a little bit of BB cream and, you know, a nice lipstick, it goes such a long way. It really does. It, it makes a huge difference. And so that's kind of been my goal moving forward is to just do what I can now with where I'm at now to have a more positive impact on how I feel about the way that I look. Yeah, and hopefully it's, you know, noticeable to other people, <laughs> not just me. You always look amazing to me, but my, <laughs> my husband, when I first started like trying to care about beauty again, he was worried about me. He, he thought that, cause I think I tend to get obsessive about things. And I think he thought that I was getting into some kind of like obsessive phase where I <laughs> hated my body. And so I was trying to change it or something. And I was like, no, I'm just trying to like be more conscious of the way that I'm presenting myself. And over the next few weeks, he started to notice that it was affecting my own confidence when I would put on makeup or try to pick out an outfit and not just put on my normal workout outfit that I used to wear every day. And he started to make comments like, wow, I can see that this is that you're enjoying this and that it's good for you. And so I think it was kind of changing my demeanor, too. And so it did have that positive effect. But I'm glad that the group that we're in is Catholic because it's easy to go down that rabbit hole of just becoming obsessed with beauty and makeup and stuff for like the wrong reasons. And so, yeah. Well, you're talking right. about like makeup and, you know, like having to get dressed up because what do you do to make yourself feel attractive or to feel confident? That's going to be different for each person. Right. And it could even just be, when we're talking about self care. It's not literally, okay, well I have to put on mascara and foundation and lipstick every day. Now, even something as little as washing my face twice a day, <laughs> That's an effort. I'm not even kidding. That is like an actual effort. I have to like I have to make myself do it, especially at the end of the day, because I do not want to. I do not want to. All I want to do is lay down and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. But even just taking care of your skin or reminding yourself to take a shower every day. Mm -hmm. um, any mom out there can probably identify with that. Reminding yourself, hey, I need to go shower and taking the time for that. It makes a difference. It really does. Like just Taking that time to take care of yourself and no one else, even just basic, I'm going to wash my face tonight. Right. <laughs> it makes you feel better. It yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. It's just starting with three or five minutes of self-care and then seeing how you feel and how much you want to add after that. Um, but yeah, just getting that minimum in there has been really helpful to me. Um, 
the last question that I had was why do we put effort into beauty and fashion from like a Catholic perspective? And I think that, that we've pretty much gone over that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm from a Catholic perspective, I think, I mean, sort of a different kind of, I don't know, segue um, is that it can be hard in Catholic circles um, because on the one hand, you have the judgy McJuggersons that are, you know, oh, well, you know, you can't wear cap sleeves or right. you shouldn't wear pants. Yes. Let's remember that. No pants, right? Women can't wear pants. Um, but then you have, you know, it goes too far the other way, you know, where you'll maybe see someone at mass that's, you know, wearing like booty shorts. And right. so, so it's, you know, how do you find like a healthy middle ground where you're being respectfully modest or, you know, while still being fashionable and stylish? Um, it's a Catholic woman respecting the fact that, you know, you're a child of God. Um, and for some people, you know, wife and a mother, maybe you're not married, but, you know, all the same, you know, dressing the right way for where you are in life and, you know, crossing the line, making sure you're not crossing the line between, you know, makeup and self-care to vanity because you right. can't go too far in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I, so, I mean, there definitely is the Catholic, you know, kind of culture, depending on where you are, what you get caught up in, you know, like if you go to a more traditional parish, maybe you get the no pants brigade coming after you. <laughs> um, yep. Um, that, yeah, I think that point about balance is really what it all boils down to. Um, and that's, it's so helpful to have a community that's supportive of just like individuals trying to find the balance, um, for themselves and not rather than having like a list of, I've literally seen modesty lists where it's like you count two fingers beneath your, you know, collarbone and anything below that is immodest. And it's complete modesty is subjective. I mean, not in the sense that someone wearing a bikini to mass might it's is modest. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but everybody is different. And um I think we need to trust our fellow Catholic women a little bit more to like try to be doing what's right for them. And yeah. So yeah, these the modesty conversations I know growing up, especially as like a homeschooler. Um, in a lot of traditional Catholic circles, there was like a really unhealthy um, view of modesty and body image. And I, that's something I should have mentioned at the beginning is that the, the there's Catholic extremes that also affected and confused me um, about my own self-image. And so it's been a process. I'm very much still learning, um, but I'm really grateful that there is the internet so that we can talk to other Catholic women and like figure these things out together. So, well, and too, like when you go too far on the modesty bandwagon, when it's this, you know, again, no pants or, you know, the two finger rule or, you know, no cap sleeves, it's, it's, it's making it to where your body is something to be hidden, to be ashamed of. That's not going to be good for your body image either. I, I mean, when you sit there and think, Oh, well, I, I have to cover myself. I have to hide myself because th that's, that's going to make you see your body as something to be ashamed of. Like it's not something that needs to be hidden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I see like somebody did ask the question, how do we strike the balance between like enjoying our makeup and hiding behind it? And I know for me that didn't really happen until I did have like the third baby and kind of like realized how amazing my body was by itself. Um, in complete vulnerability, it was just strong and capable. And so for me, um, that, I don't know, somehow, I don't know how, but that sort of empowered me to be able to view makeup as like a way to um, enjoy. I enjoy putting on the makeup. I enjoy the end result, but I also don't at all view it as something that I'm ashamed to go out bare faced um, anymore or anything like that. So I don't know, for me, there was just that somehow that experience that changed the way that I viewed my body in general. And so um, that also affected the way that I interact with makeup. I Yeah. And I've never felt like I'm hiding behind makeup because this is still how I look. I'm just, what's uh, enhancing? Com yeah, enhancing it. Yes, I could think in complimenting. Like, no, that's not the word. Yeah, I'm, I'm enhancing it. And especially on if I'm just going to run errands, you know, and it's it's more low key. Like, I'm if I'm just going to be 
out going to target with my kids you know i'm not gonna do like this whole like my video face mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know i'll just put on like some bb cream and a little bit of mascara and some more natural lipstick and it helps because i feel like i do not look like death warmed over anymore <laughs> you know <laughs> now i look like a normal human being <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel like more awake and yeah. alive. Yes, yeah, exactly. And and it just, I mean, again, it, for me personally, it helps me, you know, with that little bit of self care. Again, coming back to just taking that five minutes for myself, and it it boosts my confidence. And maybe other people will look at me and still think, "Wow, that girl is really tired." They probably do, but you know. <laughs> It still makes me feel better. So I mean, whatever. I mean, that's yeah. that's really all that, that that matters. You know, that's that's all that matters. Yeah, that's a good point. If you're doing, maybe that is kind of like a good um, guideline. Are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it for someone else? Because if the latter, then you're probably hiding behind your makeup. But if you're doing it for yourself, I don't see how you could be really like hiding behind it. You know what I mean? So yeah. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Any any last thoughts, Kathy? Cassie? No, we, um, I think we covered a lot of good ground. Yeah, and we'd love to continue this conversation. So um, one thing, leave comments, ask questions. We'd love to interact, share our video if you feel so inclined, like our page. Um, and also, if you guys have suggestions for videos that you would like to see, please feel free to message us or comment on a video and let us know because um, we don't have like an editorial calendar where we have all the videos planned out for the next year. We just kind of like, uh, wrap up every video every week and then say, okay, what should we do next week? And so <laughs> suggestions are totally welcome. That's the way we roll. So please feel free to make a suggestion um, or send us like uh, a book topic or something that you would like us to talk about and we will do that. Um, so from Cassie and I here at Fidelis, where there's no right way to be a Catholic woman, we will see you guys next week and have a good one.